All right, well, good afternoon. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you today in Brisbane. I would like to warmly welcome you all, many of you existing shareholders and some of you uh, interested investors. We hope you enjoy the presentation. My name is Rob Milner and I'm the fourth generation chairman of Watchley and Aid Sol Pattinson. Joining me here today is Todd Barlow, our CEO and Managing Director, who first joined the business in 2004. Todd has been our CEO for the last eight years. David Gribben, our Chief Financial Officer, he's been with us since 2018. Brendan O'Day, our Chief Investment Officer. Brendan joined us in 2021 at the time of the Milton merger. And Courtney Howe, who's our um, um, responsible for corporate affairs. She's organised the whole day today, so thanks very much, Courtney. Now, in the room, we also have some of our um, representatives from our, some of our investee companies with us today, so thank you very much for those people for coming along. Todd will start the presentation shortly, and there will be time for Q&A at the end before some light lunch will be served. But first, this year marks 120 years of being a listed company. So we have a short video to play next, which gives you a taste of some of the history behind our company and how we have evolved into a highly diversified investment company with over $10 billion in assets. And as you, you'll no doubt hear from these younger ones, they're the ones that are going to drive the company forward going forward, so starting other, another new chapter to make the next 120 years. So enjoy the video and enjoy your day. I look forward to chatting with you afterwards. In 2023, Watching and Age Sale Pattinson is a very, very unique company. This is our 120th year of being listed, which is now on the Australian Stock Exchange. Over that period of time, this company has never failed to pay a dividend, and that includes the war years, the Great Depression, the GFC, and recently the COVID period. It's been my great pleasure as a fourth generation chairman of this company to be able to deliver wonderful returns over generations for our shareholders. And also my son, Tom Milner, now being the fifth generation, sits on the Sol Pattinson board. It wasn't really till after the First World War in the early 50s that Sol Pattinson moved away from pharmacy and started his journey on diversification where we are at today. The mining boom came in the late 60s, early 70s, and that really gave Sol's the impetus to move away from pharmacy. And with the advent of diversification, we became involved in New Hope, now a $5.5 billion coal mining company. We did a cross shareholding with Brickworks, which is Australia's largest manufacturer of, of clay products. When I joined the board in 1984, uh, shortly afterwards, we got involved with television. At that particular time, Channel 7 and Channel 9 had been sold, and we bought Newcastle TV station NBN Television for $38 million. And over the period of time, that $38 million now sits as a 12.5% interest in TPG, which has a market cap of over $7 billion. So it's been a wonderful investment for us. The business has evolved significantly over 120 years, and today Solpats is a top 100 ASX listed company with over 60,000 shareholders and more than $10 billion in assets. Our portfolio is a unique investment proposition on the Australian market, comprising assets in listed equities, private equity, direct property, and structured yield. We carefully construct the portfolio to achieve three key objectives. The first objective is to maximise growth over the long term. The second objective is to maximise uh, cash from the portfolio, which we use to pay higher dividends to shareholders. And the third is to manage investment risk across the portfolio so that we preserve capital in downtimes. Solpats has been able to achieve all of these things quite well over the last few decades. And over 20 years, we've achieved greater than 3% higher than market per annum, which means that an investment in Solpats has achieved a nine times uh, total growth whereas an investment in the market has achieved just five times. And in fact, over 40 years, Solpats has achieved greater than 15% annualised growth. In 2021, we merged with Milton Corporation, which was transformational for the business. Brendan O'Day joined us as Chief Investment Officer at that time, and the merger provided us with the scale and liquidity to pursue new investment opportunities. Since then, we've been focused on private equity and structured yield investments. 
We were really innovative in the late 1980s when we split our shares. Both Brickworks and Sol Pattinson split their shares at about the same time, and we were the first two companies to actually do that. In the early 2000s, we established Pitt Capital Partners. So Ron Brearley launched a takeover bid for Brickworks and we chased people to come and represent us. And after it was all over, I said to David Fairfall that maybe we should start our own investment bank. And that's how Pitt Capital Partners was, was started. When we talk about long-term investing, we live and breathe it. As Rob mentioned, many of our investments in our strategic portfolio have been with us for a number of decades. But long-term doesn't just mean holding for the long-term. It means thinking about the long-term investment fundamentals of a business and the industry in which it operates. And if you look at our private equity portfolio today, we're invested in agriculture, we're invested in education through our swim schools with aquatic achievers, we're invested in the energy transition through AMP control, and we're invested in wealth management in a business called Iron Bark. Well, long-term also doesn't mean merely setting and forgetting our portfolio. We are extremely active and one of our key competitive advantages is our unconstrained mandate that allows us to invest across different asset classes in different times. Without good people, you don't have a business. And I, and I think that's been a great key to our success, not only within Sol Pattinson, but our investment companies have always been run by very good people. Mind you, we, we've made the odd mistake, but we've made a lot more good decisions than bad decisions. The other important factor is too that we've always had cash and it's only been recently in this very recent period of very, very low interest rates that we've actually never borrowed any money. So we've always been able to move very quickly when we've had cash. Jim Milner said to me very early on in my career that if you've got common sense, you'll go a long way. I'm proud to say that we've been able to capture and maintain all of the old-fashioned ways of doing business. We do the right thing, we look after our people and we look after our communities. And first and foremost, we're here to serve our shareholders. Our business has been structured in a way such that it's all about the team maximising the whole rather than any individual focused on one part of the portfolio. We've all learned and developed the Soul Pats way of investing, backing good people, investing for the long term, making common sense disciplined investment decisions and not merely following the masses. It's been an excellent track record and we're very excited about the future. Thank you to all shareholders for your continued support over the 120 years. Without you and our staff and our staff of investee companies, we wouldn't have a business. So I thank you very, very much for what you've done for this company over a very long period of time. Good afternoon everybody, my name's Todd Barlow and um, I hope I don't repeat ourselves too, too often by uh, doubling up with that, that video, but um, I'll, uh, yeah, as I said in the, in the, in the video, uh, the business has evolved quite significantly over the 120 year lifespan as a listed company, uh, but one thing that you know, hasn't changed is, is our, um, uh, our single purpose about building enduring value for our shareholders. Everything that we do is about maximising returns and making sure that the portfolio is resilient uh, through all parts of the cycle. And so today, I mean, as we, as we said, you know, from the, the roots in pharmacy, uh, what we have today is a diversified financial um, investment house that uh, invests across a range of asset classes, and that's unique in the Australian market. There are other listed uh, investment vehicles, but they tend to be single asset classes, whether that's small cap equities, large cap equities, global equities, or something like that. There's only one place where you can get uh, in, in one single share access to a variety of different asset classes uh, that are uh, professionally managed and, and sourced. And uh, yeah, we think that we are very good managers of capital, good allocators of capital, uh, and also um, uh, we receive a lot of good deal flow uh, across the Australian market. Our objectives are, are simple. Uh, yeah, we want to grow the portfolio and we want to we grow it faster than market. Uh, also, we want to increase the cash generation that we receive out of the portfolio, and that's what underpins our dividends, and, and, uh, and our goal is to continually increase dividends. But importantly, you know, we want to do that in a way where we're not taking on excess risk. And so it's really important to us to manage investment risk in the portfolio so that we protect the downside in difficult times. And in fact, I'll show you later on with some slides there that that's a, a key source of our outperformance is protecting capital when things get tough. 
So our approach is that we're disciplined investors, and of course everyone wants to be disciplined, but it, it is something that we have to remind ourselves every day that we need to make decisions that are long-term uh, in, in their focus, uh, we're, that we're patient, that we wait for the right time to do things, that we're doing them for the right reason and not doing them just because everybody else is. Uh, the unconstrained mandate is a fancy way of saying that we have flexibility to do different things and that's really important as well because uh, you know, a lot of investment managers out there are constrained in their ability to only do the single thing that they raise their capital to do. And there might be times when it's not very attractive for them to do that. We have the ability to, to look at different parts of the, the market and move towards those segments when we think that they are the right time and, and, and it's the right thing for the portfolio. And so by doing that, we've actually created a truly diversified portfolio. Now, when we say truly diversified, we want to uh, differentiate that from being merely diversified in the layman's uh, view, which is owning lots of different things. Uh, and particularly, you know, if you look at a lot of sort of equities portfolios, they are diversified by just having lots of different equities in the portfolio. And our view on that is, is that that is not only um, diluting your best ideas because you're going to eventually revert to the mean uh, and start performing in line with the market, but in addition to that, uh, the equity market is only one asset class and it will rise and fall uh, over time. And, and, and so we think that you need to have more uh, uncorrelated assets in your portfolio to reduce risk and, and ultimately enhance returns. We take a long-term focus uh, and uh, you know, I mentioned in the video that that doesn't merely mean holding things for the long term, it means taking a long-term view about the, uh, the assets that we buy and looking at uh, industries with strong tailwinds because we think that even average businesses do well in, uh, in industries which have uh, natural tailwinds that help them and vice versa, even good companies uh, struggle when the, the, the headwinds in an industry uh, prevent them from doing well. So we, we, we take a long-term view about the, the industries, but we also take a long-term view about the approach with those investments that we are supporting. We want to build businesses that are resilient and strong for the long term, uh, and that often takes time. Uh, we're active and opportunistic, so again, you know, it's not about sort of setting and forgetting the portfolio. We are constantly tinkering. We're constantly looking for the next big thing. If there are things in the portfolio that are uh, you know, the right time to sell or, or not performing, we will move them. Uh, and, and you know, we're not emotional about that decision. Uh, and so in the last 12 months, we've done about $3 billion of transaction activity. So we are very, very active. And lastly, it's important to us that we are trusted partners. Trusted partners with our shareholders, uh, but also trusted partners with the people that uh, we, we're doing business with, because we want to be the partner of choice. You know, most people, when they're raising capital, have options available to them. Uh, and we want them to choose us and, and often they give us a better deal because they like the idea of working with us over the long term to build a good business. So looking at those things in terms of the year to date performance, the nine months to 30 April, uh, growth in the portfolio has been reasonably good, uh, you know, particularly in the, in the context of us having a very defensive stance in terms of our portfolio. We've been a little pessimistic about um, where we are at in terms of the economic cycle. The market has been an, a lot stronger than we expected. Um, so, you know, to, to have generated a 1.4% outperformance against the market is unexpected, I guess. Um, but, um, you know, we'll take it when we get it. But, uh, but you know, I, I think we're still continuing to have a defensive mindset. In terms of cash generation, we, we're getting really good cash out of the portfolio. And, and, and I think the best evidence of that is what you saw in the, um, the final dividend last year was up, uh, I think, 19%, and the interim dividend this year was up 24%. That's telling you that we feel really good about the, the cash flow generation across the portfolio and the outlook, because of course we want to keep uh, increasing dividends from where we are. And then in terms of the way that we're managing investment ri risk across the portfolio, um, you know, we've increased our allocation to cash, uh, but we're also putting a lot of money into uh, structured yield, which are uh, credit instruments to Australian corporates. Uh, we, we do that because we think we're getting very attractive returns there, and that portfolio is generating a cash yield of about 13%. Um, but more importantly, it provides downside protection. So if, if, um, if things uh, go wrong uh, with, with any of those companies, the, the equity will be hit first before, before debt loses a dollar. So we think that there's very strong um, uh, risk-reward 
uh, opportunity there in structured yield, and that, that portfolio now is approaching a billion dollars. Uh, and and $500 million of that uh, has been invested in, in, the, in the, the nine months year to date. We've also been putting money to work in private equity. We're, we're building some really exciting businesses in our private equity uh, portfolio. Uh, I think we've deployed capital into all of our major uh, platform businesses, uh, which I, I mentioned in the video was uh, agriculture. We're continuing to build out assets there. Um, the the Brisbane-based Aquatic Achievers, we've just bought a, a New South Wales-based swim school called Carlisle, uh, and that's going to provide increased scale. Um, we also put some money to work in, uh, in Ironbark, and we bought out 50% of AMP Control, which is an electrical engineering business, which we're really excited about because it'll have uh, an opportunity to capitalise on the energy transition story that's going to play out. Uh, and uh, you know, we think we can uh, build that business both organically and in inorganically. Uh, I mentioned the, you know, the, 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 the proud history that we have in terms of our, the dividends and, and Rob mentioned that we've uh, never missed paying a dividend since 1903. Uh, that track record there on the graph, uh, you can see uh, you know, we are the only company on the All Ordinaries Index and there's about 500 companies in that index who have paid a, an increasing ordinary dividend every year uh, since, the, since 2001. And the, um, uh, the average uh, compound annual growth rate uh, during that period has been 8.5% per annum. But as I mentioned, you know, importantly, uh, the last two dividends that we've made uh, are well up on, their, um, on, on, on the previous year. So uh, we've, we've really stepped it up. And that's contributing to the, the, the that, that growth in dividends is uh, contributing to the long-term performance uh, of the, uh, of shares. Um, you know, we tend to focus on the longer term, the, the short term, has been excellent, but if you look at the 20-year story there, uh, the market has done total returns of about 19.2% for 20 years, uh, and we've done 3.7% better than that. And, and when, you, when you think about the compounding effect of that, uh, the All Lords Accumulation Index uh, has multiplied an investment uh, over 20 years by just under five times, uh, whereas an investment in Souls has more than doubled that performance to, to be over 10 times your original investment. Uh, and I mentioned before, you know, this idea around uh, share, protecting shareholder capital, which is really important to us. Um, you know, markets are volatile at the moment. Uh, and over the last 20 years, uh, 240 months, about a third of those months have been negative on the ASX. And, and in the down months, when, when the market has been negative, the average performance of the market has been minus 3.5% per month. And in any of those negative months, the average for souls has been 2% better per month. So we really do protect the downside and, 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 and the soul shares um, uh, in our portfolio uh, have now a, a two decade history of, of doing significantly better when the market is negative. Uh, and so then I started thinking about you know, how do we perform against other asset classes? And, and, uh, and so I looked at a, a $10,000 investment 30 years ago into various asset classes. And the first one I started with was Australian bonds. And, and if you'd put $10,000 to work uh, there, you would have uh, done 5.6% per annum uh, for about $52,000 uh, uh, in total. Uh, that $10,000 in Australian listed property uh, assets would have grown to just under $90,000, 7.6% per annum. Uh, international shares, which is the, the world market ex-Australia, uh, did a little bit better, but not much. Uh, $10,000 grew to $90, $91,000 over 30 years. Uh, Australian shares, uh, the Australian market has been quite a, a strong performing market relative to uh, the international market. Uh, but you know we've seen about 9.4% total return out of the um, out of the market for 30 years. So $10,000 has become just a, under $150,000. The $10,000 in sole shares uh, has grown to about $416,000. So we're extremely proud of that track record. Um, and uh, I think that you know, this is the market where we can continue to, to outperform. Uh, we're, we're very happy with the defensive approach that we're taking. Uh, and I think that that will uh, be fruitful for shareholders going forward. Pass over to, to uh, David Grubin, who can talk us through the, the last financials and how we view the world in terms of um, 
our statutory accounts. Uh, thanks, Todd. Um, and I'll just spend a couple of moments just touching on how we look at our numbers. I, I know I can see many of you have picked up a copy of the annual report. Um, and unfortunately, now you have to do a, like almost do a gym session before you uh, pick up and go through it because it's getting heavier every year, um, like me. But um, um, uh, I spend a little bit of time of just focusing and helping people understand that and talk a little bit about. Uh, our uh, first half results that came out in late uh, late March. So uh, if I go to this. So in terms of the way we look at uh, life, you've got your traditional statutory reporting metrics, your net profit after tax, earnings per share and, and, and balance sheet. So all staples of uh, the accounting profession and obviously you'll see all of that in the annual report. But Todd talked about the three objectives that we have about growing the portfolio, um, increase in cash generation of the portfolio, managing risk. So those three there don't really translate clearly into us doing that. So we, we focus on other things. Uh, and in particular, we look at the net cash flow from investments. So very simply, this is how much cash we get out of each of our investments. Um, and we use that then to fund the ever increasing dividends that you saw on the chart that uh, uh, Todd gave. So it's really important that our, our um, portfolio conti continues to grow um, grow uh, its its cash back to uh, to us. Um, dividend growth, obviously, a critical part of uh, our covenant with you that you know we want to uh, keep that ordinary dividend increasing year on year and 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 actually lift the trajectory of uh, that increase. And finally, the the net asset value, rather than look at the balance sheet, um, we we focus on the net asset value of a portfolio and. Much of our portfolio is listed equity, so they're easy to mark to market. Uh, and we regularly look at uh, the value of our underlying you know, private investments or uh, investments in structured yield and make sure that uh, we're comfortable with, uh, with the carrying value of those, of those, uh, those investments. So, um, uh, and obviously and finally, as um, Brendan will talk a little bit more about how the portfolio now is being rebalanced and shifted away from um, uh, and that was a, a big outcome of the, the merger with Milton, that we have the liquidity to invest in different asset classes that particularly uh, investors such as yourself don't always get access to, things like private equity or, or, or private, uh, private credit. Um, in terms of our results for the first half of this financial year, um, I'll go through what's changed between the first half last year and this year. But, but importantly, there's a couple of other changes that we've made. So at the end of the last financial year in 2022, um, many of you who have been long-term investors would have known that we consolidated New Hope. Uh, we'd always had uh, a, a substantial stake, you know, anywhere between 60 to uh, just over 40%, and we controlled the board. But at the end of July, um, our, our shareholding in New Hope fell down to just below 40%, about 38, and uh, we no longer had a uh, majority uh, independent, uh, sorry, Sol's uh, directors on the board. There's a majority of independent directors. So we, for accounting, we have to now move from consolidation to what we say equity accounting. So we don't pick up the revenue of New Hope. Uh, we just pick up our share of profit. So it doesn't change the reported profit number, but you'll see when you look at the numbers, revenue's down, uh, I think, about 74% on the half, and, and that's driven by just purely uh, the way we do accounting. Secondly, it's also meant that when you look at our uh, classification in the stock market index, we were an energy stock and now we're classified as we really are as a diversified uh, financial and, uh, uh, and, and we are a diversified asset manager. In terms of the numbers, we, uh, from a profit perspective, um, being an investment company, there's always variability in the value of the investment. So we, we for a profit perspective, focus on what we call regular, and many of you, that's our sort of underlying uh, metric, and that was up 38% on the half. Most of that, about a, just over 100 million, was coming off the back of an increased contribution from New Hope with the strong coal prices uh, that happened there. Another 20 odd million uh, came out of uh, uh, Brickworks, where uh, their industrial portfolio uh, saw some revaluation gains. And this half that just passed was the first full year from the contribution from Milton, uh, so we got some increased dividend income. Uh, and finally, we've been uh, 
uh, focusing more on what we call our structured yield book and we got some additional interest income out of that. Now that was partly offset by, we did have in the last financial, the 21 financial year, we had an investment in Round Oak, uh, which we sold in, uh, uh, in the beginning of July last year to another listed company called Eris and we have a 30% stake in that. So that didn't rep re repeat in the first half. Um, the statutory numbers or the reported profit you can see um, you know, up uh, 1.1 billion on the, on the same time last year and that, that's a quirk of accounting. Um, and if you just let me bore you for uh, 30 seconds, I'll, I'll just try and explain why we had a big loss in the first half of uh, the 22 financial year. And that was a consequence of the merger with, with, uh, with Milton. So that was a script deal. So the value of the, uh, the purchase value for accounting uh, for, for Milton was based on the share price of Soles at that time and that was around sort of $38. Um, but Milton just being a, a, a listed investment company, all of its portfolio you could mark to market uh, and there was a big difference between uh, the purchase consideration that we had to pay for accounting and what the value of the portfolio was. So in accounting speak that's usually known as goodwill but we couldn't see any long-term value from that so we just took that on the on the chin and wrote that off. It doesn't mean that we paid overpaid for Milton. It was just a sheer consequence of the, the run up in the share price, which we had no control over. So that triggered a, 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 a loss in the first half last year. Non-cash, not to be repeated. Uh, and obviously this year, um, you can see that's resulted in a very, very large turnaround uh, in the, the reported profit for the half. Um, so with that, I'm gonna hand over to Brendan, who's gonna take you through um, the nuts and bolts of the portfolio and how it's been changing over time. So organised here. Thank you, DG. Uh, look, it's great to be here with you uh, um, visiting Brisbane. It's the first time we've done this in Brisbane, uh, so it's, it's, it's great to be up here with you. And <laughs> we'll try and make it not the last. Uh, and the cool thing is my dad lives in Brizzy as well, so I got a chance to spend the weekend with him and we went sailing. It was really nice, enjoyed the warm weather. So, uh, yeah, maybe we uh, make sure it's not our last, right? Uh, so in my presentation, I'm going to sort of walk through the portfolio. Um, and I hope I don't lose you. I'll try and do it in a little bit of detail, but not too much detail. But just to give you a sense of the size of the portfolio, uh, the composition of it, the changes we've made recently, those types of things. And the Souls Pats portfolio is one that's in transition, really, and, and Todd referenced our history, but we're going to look to our history to sort of guide the way that we take this, uh, this portfolio in the future. Now, prior to the merger with Milton, uh, which we've talked about a bit, so I won't get into, um, the success of our primary investments over time, and I'll get to those in a minute, really left us with a portfolio that was highly concentrated uh, in three stocks primarily. Uh, but the Milton merger added diversity to the portfolio uh, in a way that we didn't have beforehand and created a far more liquid portfolio in the aggregate. So that allowed us to do a few things. It allowed us to reinvest in other assets, largely private assets, which I'll get into today, um, and just take the portfolio to a, to a more uh, sort of neutral setting, a more cashed up setting, which, we, uh, which we're quite enjoying right now. Um, regardless of the asset class, though, we're striving to build a portfolio that, that has businesses in it that have diversity. Todd touched on this earlier. Defensive qualities uh, is quite important to us. Cash generation, which DG touched on earlier. Uh, and areas in areas that have good economic tailwinds. That's what we're focused on. We've always been focused on that, and that hasn't changed. So here's a slide showing the portfolio composition uh, and the allocation that we have each, to each of these main strategies. Uh, and you know we're very flexible in terms of how we go about allocating across these strategies. And when I use the word allocation, I don't want you to sort of come away with the impression that we've got hard and fast rules about where the, where the capital gets allocated. We try to stay as flexible as we possibly can. Uh, but as we sort of sit here right now, you'll know there's actually been some quite big changes in the last 12 months for those of you who pay attention uh, to our business. Um, we think the current macroeconomic situation is complex. Um, obviously, inflation is not under control. I'm sure there are many of you out there who are feeling that or appreciate that. Rates are higher. We think they'll probably continue to go higher. Uh, and, a and a recession is definitely possible, um, probably probable in other parts of the world, but certainly possible here in Australia. So we see plenty of risks to the downside. Um, we believe the implications for our portfolio construction is pretty obvious. Um, we want to be defensive, which is, we've uh, definitely tried to do where we could, and we tried to keep our powder dry. So we're carrying a lot more cash now uh, than we have in the past. Uh, so we're defensively positioned where possible, and we're focused on investments with strong cash generation, which we think are going to hold up in those down markets that Todd touched on earlier, and that give us better risk-adjusted returns uh, in the market that we're in right now. Uh, so year to date, 
we've reduced the size of our listed equity portfolio um, and our property portfolios, raising cash for our sort of next set of investment opportunities. We've made new investments in private equities, uh, which I'll outline shortly, and we've materially grown our exposure to credit instruments, uh, which I'll also outline shortly, but we'll continue to do that. Um, our net working capital position has increased by $254 million in the period, um, and I'll touch on the composition of that later in the, uh, later in the presentation. So I'll now get into this in a little more detail. So our strategic investments, which is the traditional things that you probably uh, are familiar with with Sols, uh, contains large listed investments where we have large strategic holdings. We generally have board representation here and we have a close alignment with management and people will be very familiar with the stocks that are in this portfolio. It's now 49% of the portfolio. It was 75% of the portfolio uh, prior to the merger, so it's considerably lower in terms of the, in terms of the mix, but still very big uh, for us in terms of portfolio composition. Year-to-date, the return out of this portfolio is 15.7%, which is very strong, uh, New Hope helping there, but all of the stocks in this portfolio, all of the investments in this portfolio perform very, very well. Um, these investments really form the core of our long-term performance and our cash generation. And each of them are generating good solid cash right now, and you can see that in our confidence around, around dividends going forward. Uh, they're all well positioned. We feel pretty confident around the, the performance of each of these things, each of these investments. Uh, and they each have things that we believe will enhance the returns over time, uh, both in terms of dividend income to us and, and, and share price. Turning now to large caps. So large caps is the former Milton portfolio, although it looks quite different now. Um, I have a hand in managing that portfolio day to day, but we've been adding to the team, so we've been putting some new, uh, some new talented managers in there to keep an eye on that. Uh, and at the time of the merger, the combined portfolios, these combined portfolios were around $4 billion. And as you can see right now, it's closer to 2.8. Um, the portfolio previously had over 100 investments, that's now closer to 45. Uh, so the portfolio aims haven't really changed. So still, we still aim to generate consistent and consistent growth and tax effective income out of this portfolio. We like our franking credits and we'll continue to feel that way. Uh, it also acts as a source of liquidity for the broader portfolio. And you can see the fact that it's gone down from $4 billion to 2.8 um, is a result of us liquidating part of that portfolio to do some other things. And we're very, we're very confident with that approach. Um, and we've used the strength in the markets that we've seen candidly, which we find a bit surprising over the last 12 to 18 months to make those sales. Um, those sales have gone into cash balances, but they've also gone into structured credit uh, and private equity as well. So we've been moving the portfolio around in a way that um, perhaps you, uh, you certainly wouldn't be familiar with um, when it was the Milton portfolio. And the good news about that is we can do that without any tax friction. Uh, prior to the merger, we had, uh, we had some tax consequences of being that active, uh, which are no longer a concern for us. Uh, so the portfolio is very defensively positioned. The portfolio itself looks a bit like this, and I apologise for, for eyes, but it will give you some idea of what's in the portfolio, and I'm happy to talk to you uh, about it afterwards. But the top 30 investments are shown here uh, and represent about 93% of the portfolio, so it's actually a lot more concentrated than it used to be. Uh, we are underweight banks, and for those of you familiar with Milton, um, you would realise that that's quite different to how we used to be positioned. Um, we're underweight resources, although we're quite overweight energy, courtesy of New Hope, but... Um, uh, and we're underweight REITs and consumer discretionary. So that's a, a sort of classic positioning for a, for a cautious uh, sort of recessionary environment. Uh, we're overweight consumer staples, uh, diversified financials, and healthcare. So the portfolio is deliberately conservatively positioned right now, deliberately defensively positioned right now, uh, and we have plenty of dry powder to react uh, should we want to uh, change the way this portfolio is you know, constructed in future. Uh, but our focus really remains on investing in companies that are going to give us growing earnings and dividends. So if we don't see an opportunity to grow earnings or dividends out of any of the investments in this portfolio, we'll look to make a different decision. Uh, we're looking for businesses that are best in class. We don't need to own everything in a sector. We're happy just to own the best in class. And we now have the flexibility to do that should we choose to. And we're looking for exposure to positive long-term trends, much like we do in other parts of the business. Focusing on private equity for the moment, um, it's an area of clear focus for us, um, and we look to partner with businesses and grow with them over the time. Over time, and Todd touched on the idea that we want to be trusted capital. Um, that's very much how we go after uh, this part of our business. It's an attractive segment. Um, assets are remaining in the private space in increasing numbers, uh, and the available pool of investments that have been listed on stock exchanges, many of you may have observed, have been declining over time. And I'm sure you've all had companies that you used to own um, that have been taken off the stock exchange, Sydney Airport, for example. Uh, which are now in private hands. So we think investors need access to private markets or you risk missing out on large parts of the investable universe. And I think this is a bigger concern now than it has been in the past. Uh, and then through Soul Patch, you get that opportunity. 
we're not like a common private equity fund, so I wouldn't want to leave you with that. Some of our investments are wholly owned, some are partially owned. We don't employ a lot of leverage, uh, which um, is commonly used in the in the private in the sort of private equity industry. Um, we don't lever things up, restructure them on, on sell them. We, we, we're partnership capital and we try and stay with these investments for a long time. Uh, the portfolio was at $810 million at the end of January, since grown to about $840 million. Uh, so we've been very active and will probably continue to be so. Uh, we've recently increased our investment to 100% in AMP control, which Todd touched on um, earlier. Um, AMP control itself recently acquired a small company called Androc Engineering. So we're sort of working with our investing companies to, to make them bigger and, and better. Um, Todd touched on Kirby Swim, um, which is a, a new investment in this space, and, and sort of coming together with our aquatic, aquatic achievers investment, and we're continuing to push on our agricultural investments uh, over time. So it's, a, it's an active part of the portfolio, uh, and one that we are, are very excited about. Structured yield, uh, or structured credit, is our fastest growing portfolio. So it's now at $677 million, uh, growing from $485 million in January, and as Todd mentioned, we've got visibility here uh, to make it a lot larger. Uh, again, we're very excited about the prospects uh, in this area, and as the graph shows, um, the loan book is widely spread, uh, mostly senior secured, uh, listed and unlisted uh, in terms of its format, uh, and quite diverse by industry. Uh, and we approach all of these investments with an equity hat on. Uh, so if we were happy to own the equity, we should be quite happy to own the debt, uh, considering we're, we're sort of senior in the stack, and so long as we're getting an adequate return. And the structured credit market in Australia, which has not been that active for a long, long time, uh, continues to grow. Uh, and it's very well developed offshore. In fact, we've been making some offshore investments uh, in this space. Uh, as interest rates have risen across the world, we've identified this opportunity to add, this, add these credit investments to our portfolio. Uh, and we're expecting returns out of this portfolio in the 12 to 15% range, which is very compelling for us, as you can imagine. And we have visibility, or we like to think that we can grow this portfolio to about a billion and a quarter uh, in relatively short order. Uh, we think the portfolio won't just generate sort of excellent risk-adjusted returns, which we feel very strongly about, but excellent headline returns in terms of actually the running yield, which allows us obviously to increase our own cash uh, and, pay, uh, and pay increasing dividends. Turning now to emerging. Uh, emerging companies' portfolio is managed by a great team uh, who also run our structured yield strategy, so that's, uh, they're busy people. Uh, the portfolio is generally small cap equities, uh, and at the end of January, it was about $550 million. It's now $610 million. Uh, that's actually a little smaller than it was uh, at the start of the, uh, the financial year, so we're, we're quite active in terms of going up and down in terms of sizing uh, in this portfolio. And we've performed well in this space over the cycle because we've been able to be active. Um, the portfolio is increasingly exposed to the more defensive end of the small cap universe, so we're away from the sort of technology side of things, away from the rate-sensitive parts of that uh, market and in sort of... Uh, slightly more industrial, straightforward companies in that space, but we perform very well in this portfolio. Uh, and we still remain a little cautious about anybody who's got rates leverage. Uh, but it's a, it's a well-performing portfolio for us uh, and one that we're very active in. On the property side of things, um, we have seven, seven properties in our portfolio right now, our direct property portfolio, uh, with a value of about $113 million. Uh, we continue to look for opportunities here, but again, rates make that a little interesting right now. From a broader portfolio perspective, though, we're quite mindful uh, of our look-through exposure um, to industrial property through our investment in Brickworks, which obviously has a very large portfolio of industrial property, and we have a very large investment in Brickworks. So um, I wouldn't want to leave you with the idea that we only have $113 million worth of exposure to property. It's actually a lot larger than that. And I mentioned I'd uh, talk a bit about working cap, um, net working capital, um, which is kind of a dry term, uh, but what it really is is, is the net of our cash at bank uh, and our outstanding debt. Um, and uh, what it shows actually, and that's why we have the chart here for you, is that over the last 12 months or so, we've really transformed our financial flexibility. And you can, for, the, for those of you who are eagle-eyed in there, uh, you can probably work out that if you go back on the slide, that was, uh, that was straight after the Milton merger. Um, so we're carrying a lot of cash at the moment. Uh, th that cash can and probably will be deployed into new opportunities. So again, I wouldn't want you to have the impression that we're gonna sit on cash forever, but we do have a cautious mindset right now, and we're not in a hurry to deploy that cash. But um, uh, watch that space. Um, our current view is that glo is the global economy will slow. Uh, I think it's logical to conclude that corporate earnings will probably slow alongside of that. And we position the aggregate portfolio in a, in a defensive sort of manner um, to reflect that. And we're very happy to be carrying dry powder. Um, so we think we'll find some great investment opportunities over the upcoming period, um, be that months, be that years. Uh, we're happy to be patient and wait. Uh, but um, I think through an investment in souls, um, you get a wonderful exposure to all these asset classes. You get a wonderful exposure to the opportunities. Um, Souls has a wonderful long-term history and legacy. 
Um, I think we have best-in-class performance, not just over the last 12 months, but over a very long period of time, as Todd highlighted. We've got consistent dividend growth. We've got a great team of people who are working for your benefit, and everybody within the investment team acts like owners. There's no fees eating away at your performance. There's no performance fees. There's no management fees. There's none of those things. Uh, and you now get access to all the, all the assets out there, not just listed equity. So uh, we're very excited about the portfolio. We've had a good performance this year. Uh, we're setting it up for the future, um, and I will stop there. We've got one more slide to go, which Todd will take us through, and I think then we'll go to questions after that. Thanks, uh, Brendan. I think Brendan raises a really uh, important point about uh, our access to liquidity. Um, and not only are we sitting on reasonable levels of cash right now, um, I guess, uh, you know, it's sort of 5% of the portfolio, um, but we have access to significant liquidity elsewhere, which enables us to take advantage of any good new opportunities that, that arise. And, and, and we think this is the market where those opportunities come to us. There's clearly dislocation, IPOs are not happening, um, debt is harder to access. Um, uh, yeah, there, there's there's uh, di different uh, volatility in, in markets. There's um, uh, you know, ch challenging economic conditions. So I think this is the time where we do our, our best work. And we certainly have an active pipeline of investments that are under consideration. Uh, and we have that flexibility to be able to take advantage of those situations. Um, but, but right now, even without looking at those opportunities, uh, we've got a lot of confidence in our defensive standing um, across the portfolio. It's performing well, even in a strong market. Uh, it certainly has performed well over the last 20 years. Uh, but you know, I guess the, the, the takeaway that we'd like for you to, uh, to have from this session is that uh, you know, we think that, that that performance will continue. Uh, we think that uh, uh, you know, the business is in actually better shape than it's ever been before. The merger between Sol Pats and, uh, and Milton created uh, a stronger business for both companies and, and both sets of shareholders. Uh, and uh, you know, I, ho I hope we've been able to convey that we're very excited about the future and, and, and where, we, uh, where we are today and the opportunities that we've got in front of us. Uh, so I'll stop there and open it up to some questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so we've got Kim Kim Morrison here from Argyle. Maybe Kim can come up and say a few words, but I'll I'll have a bit of a uh, a go, and and then you can correct me if I'm wrong. But essentially, I mean, what we see there is a great opportunity for uh, institutionalisation of, of of farms that are um, you know subscale on their own, uh, and if you get some aggregation, uh, put some capital to work, and a lot of these a lot of these farms might be capital starved. Uh, so you know, we buy the water to de-risk the the, um, uh, the, the, the water conditions, we put up uh, nets to stop hail damage, we put up wind breaks to stop um, you know, the, the, the rubbing of fruit, and we're really investing in you know, new varieties uh, and things like that that will, that will um, really in enhance yields over time. So what we're focused on is uh, horticultural assets, and you know, this is high-end uh, export quality uh, citrus and um, uh, stone fruit and table grapes and uh, kiwi fruit and things like that. Um, so there's a really nice portfolio that has geographic diversity across Australia. Um, but it's been a, a fabulous uh, asset class for a long time, particularly you know, some, some assets like water. And I think water is an example where the institutionalisation of an asset class that uh, wasn't, you know, I guess, on the radar for investors in the past, uh, over time that becomes investable uh, and it becomes uh, you know, more accessible and, and, and you actually get a, an increase in pricing. And we think the same thing will happen with, 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 uh, with the, uh, you know, the farming assets as well. They're not institutional. There's not very many opportunities for uh, the retail investor to get access to agricultural product. But over time, you know, all of these kind of family-owned businesses will increase in scale and, and, and it'll become an institutional product. Kim, you got anything to add on that? Uh, thanks, Todd. Um, yeah, I mean, you covered it very well. I think, first of all, we're 
very much taking a risk management approach to agriculture and what we're doing is investing in irrigated agriculture. So we're mitigating some of that climatic variability that is inherent in the sector. We're very much focused with a sort of private equity approach around agriculture's owned by families, they're starved of capital. There's real barriers to entry around some of these industries where particularly horticulture, you're growing permanent tree crops that take maybe five or six years to get established. So that creates this barrier of families not being able to pursue that very easily, which is where we're applying the capital to build out those assets that then are servicing premium export markets. So we're really then looking at what are these customers across Asia, high net wealth com uh, countries that are demanding this produce that we can produce here, that they can't produce in their own geography, that we can then build supply chains, branding, uh, to then extract the premiums that exist in that supply chain and uh, then take this you know, to, the, to the next level as far as being able to derive some really great businesses at scale, uh, very professional approach and uh, focused on ultimately returns that are consistent with Solpat's approach. Um, I wonder, is it on? I wonder if you could touch on um, New Hope. Um, in doing so, could you could you just touch on the um, the reduction in equity that I think you mentioned earlier? Mm -hmm. uh, impact of the government Queensland government um, taxation and um, its prospects for the future. Sure. Um, I'll take the easy one first. So the, the increased royalties that the Queensland Government instituted last year obviously didn't impact us uh, as yet because we uh, are not operational in Queensland. So the, the ACMA mine has been sitting there trying to get approvals now for you know, 14 years or something like that. Um, we thought we were ready to go. and We've got another uh, court action coming at us. So, um, so we, we are not producing at the moment, so the royalties aren't, aren't impacting us. It, it also, even in the future, when we do get up and running, um, you know, there's a quirk of history in, in, uh, in New Hope in that we bought our own royalties back uh, many years ago, so we actually don't pay a lot of royalties to the Queensland government, um, uh, so it doesn't affect us uh, so much. Um, but, you know, we, we certainly want to see, <laughs> see that mine developed. It's cost the, uh, the state... Uh, and, and the Commonwealth huge amounts of uh, lost taxation revenue in the last few years when coal prices were very high for us not to be operating at, at Ackland. Um, but we do think we'll get there. It's one of the most um, uh, interrogated uh, mines uh, in history. Uh, we've been through a huge number of uh, uh, pieces of litigation and court processes and, and government processes. Uh, and every time we've been we've been giving the tick of approval, but we have uh, people who are just trying to delay delay us by challenging it. Um, yeah, we think that coal has has a, a bright future. Uh, um, you know, eventually coal will be transitioned away into uh, renewable um, uh, energy sources, but that's going to take some time, and uh, and we think it'll take a little longer than people expect. Uh, you know, when you think about the the global demand for energy. Uh, you know, populations increasing, urbanisation, the electrification of everything, and also the you know, one thing that the people don't appreciate is when you put renewable power into the grid, you have to put a lot more than what you would have if you were putting uh, carbon fuels in, because you you, you know you don't have that um, uh, you know constant uh, uh, source of, of, of generation. So you know, you know, renewables can be up to three times more installed capacity to meet the same as baseload from, uh, from coal. So we think that there's just going to be a huge push just to service the, the needs of the, of the growing energy consumption before we actually um, start depleting uh, our use of coal. So the demand story for coal looks pretty good. Uh, supply side, it's going to get really challenged. I mean, it's already been challenging to, to get any kind of new supply. Um, we think supply comes off. You know, a lot of existing coal mines will be exhausted and um, uh, and become higher costs so, uh, or, or poorer quality. And, and Australian coal will be some of the last coal supplied globally because it's low cost and high quality. And so, uh, you know, if we fast forward 20 years and, and actually 20 years is beyond 
the current approved uh, mine plan for both our Bangala asset in New South Wales and also Ackland in Queensland. Um, but in, in 20 years' time, um, you know, I think that uh, who knows what will be the case uh, then, but, but I think that um, yeah, right up until our, our current approvals are, are uh, finished, we'll be supplying coal at reasonably strong prices. Uh, thank you for coming to Brisbane today. It's uh, been a pleasure to have you here. I, I just had uh, two questions. I like the, the fact that uh, Sol Patterson look long term, make plans for 5, 10, 15 years down the track. Um, there's so many people today that only plan for tomorrow. But uh, I, reading the report, you're looking at the short term and long term incentive for directors and I couldn't see whether it gave the number of years for those. But so many companies today have a one year for a short term and three years for a long term for directors. Mm. To me, I think that a three-year term for uh, for a short-term bonus and a seven-year for long-term is more appropriate because one year really doesn't achieve anything. Now, I don't know what Sol Patterson do, but uh, it really doesn't um, tell me in the book that. And the other thing is, um, was Sol going to have a dividend reinvestment scheme, having taken over Milton that had that, and it, it was a very convenient form to acquire more shares without having to look at the share price and wondering whether it was up or down, just uh, take the good with the bad and, um, and, and go with the flow. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, so I'll, I'll briefly summarise our approach to remuneration. I mean, you said directors, uh, our directors don't participate in STI or LTI, um, uh, but, but the key management uh, personnel, and uh, you know, like myself, uh, have a... Um, about two thirds of my remuneration is tied to performance. Uh, now that uh, might be STI and it might be LTI, and um, and, and in relation to the, so the STI is an annual uh, bonus, uh, but the LTI is measured over three years. But then once the shares vest, they're locked up for 12 years, uh, or or until I leave. And um, uh, so it's one of the uh, you know, the, the, the longer time frames that I've seen in the market and, and you know, I'm of course happy to do that because I, I've got nearly all of my wealth tied up in, uh, in, in soul shares and, uh, and I believe in that and I also don't feel like I'm over concentrated because I, I actually have through that investment a, uh, a, a very good diversified portfolio investments. So, um, so it suits us as employees, but it also uh, is a good alignment that we've created uh, between our uh, executives and, and shareholders. Uh, on, on the DRP, um, yeah, we, we, we sort of bring it up every, every uh, six months or, or so. Um, I mean, again, there's no sort of good reason to do it and to not do it. There's, there's, there's positives and negatives both ways. Uh, you know, our view has always been it's a, a very liquid, strongly traded uh, stock, so anyone can buy shares whenever they like. Um, but, uh, but also, uh, you know, DRPs, if, if they're popular, you know, we, we can look at that. Good. <laughs> uh, Gat, good day. Uh, thanks for uh, coming. It's been a very good presentation so far. Thank you. I've just got a couple of questions. Uh, the first one was similar to the DRP question. Um, <coughs> More, uh, more along the lines of uh, issuing shares in general. Uh, there was shares issued for the um, Milton merger. Is that something that's likely to maybe be practised again in the future? Uh, that's one question. And the second question, quickly, is I was very intrigued to see BKI Investments. It's quite high up on the list there of the top 30 in the large cap portfolio. I think it was number seven. Does that imply that you see a great deal of confidence in that particular investment company, and uh, does that imply you think that there's some outperformance against the market on BKI? Yeah, on, on BKI, it's more a uh, historical thing. So the BKI portfolio was created because that was, uh, um, that was the listed equity portfolio inside Brickworks, and then Brickworks spun that out into a separately listed vehicle, and as a, a major shareholder of Brickworks, we inherited quite a large position. Um, but it's one that we're very comfortable with. It's a very high-quality management team. In fact, it's, it's run by Tom Milner, who sits on the Souls board. Um, uh, there's you know, very low management expense ratio, so you're not, you're not losing um, anything through fees. Uh, 
and so you know we're, we're kind of happy to be there it just gives us uh, exposure to the market but um, uh, which it also gives us the ability you know, and, and when Brendan's um, when, was Brent, when Brendan was running through his portfolio, it allows us to be a little bit more concentrated uh, in, in some other parts of the, the large cap portfolio because we know that BKI gives us that kind of market exposure. Um, and then in terms of the, the issuance of, of Scrib, I think Souls has only issued Scrib, uh, you know, issued new shares twice since 1903. Uh, one was um, we, we purchased the Souls private equity vehicle about 10 or 12 years ago. Uh, that was relatively small, and then the Milton one was 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 pretty significant, um, and I, I mean I think that was just a fantastic deal. It's it's turned out to be even better than I imagined it would uh, in terms of what it's done for the cash generation in the portfolio, and you're seeing that through the increasing dividends and the and the numbers that David ran through in terms of the uplift in our cash generation. Uh, it's giving us the ability to further diversify the portfolio because we've just now got access to the liquidity, we can sell down the large caps, uh, equities, and deploy that into these other asset classes which we think are really exciting. And, and one of the things that we were challenged by before was that we had such fabulous growth in assets like TPG, New Hope and Brickworks, um, that not only were we quite concentrated in that those uh, three investments were about 70% of the portfolio, but they, were, they had huge embedded tax positions. So if we ever sold any of them to deploy that capital elsewhere, uh, you know, for every dollar that we sold, we'd only end up with 70 cents. And now I've got to go and put that 70 cents to work somewhere else and generate a, over 40% return just to get back to square one. So one of the other great advantages that we got through the Milton transaction was some tax offsets. Uh, and, and David talked about the, you know, the write-off of goodwill. Well, that actually gives us um, some... Um, tax offsets, so that means that we can now trade our portfolio and, and, and uh, in, a, in a more liquid uh, way and it allows us to be a lot more flexible. So it was, it was one of the, the, the best things that we've done. But, you know, we don't have any uh, agenda to do any, any more of that. I mean, that, was, that, that gave us everything that we need strategically. Uh, I just had a question about the long-term equity investments. Um, the list that was put up before, which I presume is relatively recent, was a little different in the top three or four equities compared with that in the annual report. I was just wondering if one of you could comment on um, the reasons for that. For instance, the Commonwealth Bank was number three, and now it's considerably lower. I didn't see it on the list before you took the slide down. No, look, I mean, we... Uh Todd touched on the sort of activity levels that we've had lately, so and the tax position of the portfolio. So the portfolio is at a place now where we're able to be quite active with it. So uh, post year end, we've definitely moved the portfolio around. We've raised cash out of the portfolio as well, so some of that moving around has generated on generated increased cash balances. But we've done a few deliberate things in the portfolio in terms of taking it to a, a much more conservative setting, uh, and some of that involved, for example, selling down the retail banks. Uh, we're underweight the retail banks now quite meaningfully which is not a position we were in before, but you, you picked that up as well. Um, we've also reduced the size of our largest investment, which was Macquarie at the time, so it was 11% of the portfolio. It's probably closer to 8.5 or 9 now. Um, so, yeah, the portfolio's been quite, you know, actively moved around. Um, and I think that will just be a sort of a time and a place thing. I think once we get a portfolio setting that we like, we may be less active. Um, if the market's in a bit of a state of, uh, of adjustment, which we think it is right now, uh, we'll, we're likely to be a little more active. So, so that is absolutely more or less the current position. Uh, that was at the end of April. Uh, the end of May will look a little different, although I don't think we've been that busy the last month. Um, so it's going to be constantly moving around. Uh, and just because we're underweight, for example, the, the retail banks right now, that doesn't mean we'll always stay that way. So one of the nice things about the setting that we have right now and frankly, it's not something you could have done inside a listed investment company like Milton, uh, is we're able to move the portfolio around up and down without incurring this major tax slippage, um, which really leaves a lot of those LICs hostage to their portfolio. And we're certainly not in that position right now. Uh, we can make the, the, the listed portfolio bigger, we can make it smaller, and we can change the complexion of it as well. So, so it's absolutely a, uh, a, a deliberate thing, and uh, it's something we'll continue doing. Provide some detail, please, on the investment in Chewis, um, the size of it, the, what do you think the future is, uh, how, what the relationship is with David Teo, what, what's his investment currently and his involvement? Um, <laughs> Rob's on the board. I'm, I'm, I sit on the board of Chewis. Um, David Teo, um, as you probably well know, um, came to us 
some years ago when we had Sol Pattinson Telecommunications, which was a listed vehicle, and um, we put the two together, and um, that's where we have um, TPG. And then David had a, an idea, being a Malaysian, um, and knowing the Singapore market, that there was an opportunity for someone to go in and be a disruptor in the Singapore market. Um, I'm pleased to report that um, nearly every month in the last probably 18 months we've increased by 100, 120,000 EBITDA a month. We now I think last month we did about $3.2 million EBITDA. We've now got about 8% um, population uh, share of the um, uh, market in, in, in Singapore. Um, we, we struggle over COVID, of course, but it's very similar to what TPG and Telstra did here. Um, TPG actually lost $100 million the first year of COVID in, in Australia and um, TUAS had the same problem in, um, in Singapore. We weren't getting the foreign workers and we weren't getting the travellers coming in buying the, the cheap um, SIM cards. Uh, I've got a lot of faith in what David's been able to do there and um, I think you see the share price is eighty or something, is it, at the moment, somewhere around there, which has done very well. But it's, it's a business to continue to grow. And we own 25% uh, of that. Uh, company David Teo owns 35 percent, and our our stake's worth about 180 million dollars. Yeah, I'd just uh, just like to say thank you for uh, organising this meeting in Brisbane today, and just like to say thank you to the management for the stewardship of the company, Appreciate and what a good company that is stable business that you have. Uh, I've got just two questions on New Hope. Uh, first question, with the current legal wranglings again, has that stopped development of Stage 3? And my second question is on um, the land holdings that New Hope has around Ipswich, if there's any current plans with any development or anything with them. Thanks. Roger, do you want to take the, the land holdings one? Do you have any update on anything that we're doing there? You're supposed to be running the show. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, as, as Todd explained earlier to an earlier question about royalties, New Hope has purchased in, in Queensland all its all its own land. We have about twenty five thousand acres there. Um, when we originally got permission to do ten million tons, um, we went to the Toowoomba um, Council and uh, bought their recycled water. Um, so we have a, have a lot of water there. Um, we're looking to do something we're not sure obviously with with the, with the mining where we're going to go but we're, we're looking at maybe putting some um, wind turbines or solar um, we're rehabbing a lot of the uh, the country there we've done some very impressive cattle trials there and we've actually the the cattle have outperformed on the uh, regenerated pasture than what they did on the, on the pasture before um, so we're looking at those land holdings there what we're going to do with it we, as i said we've got a lot of water but we're just mindful of whether we get the mining approvals or not um, in the Hunter Valley at, um, at Musselbrook, Bengala, we have some magnificent country there on, on the Hunter River, uh, which is unfortunately West Farmers and Rio, Rio let um, fall away. So we're now um, in the process of developing some of that land there, um, sowing it down to loosen, etc. And again, we have a lot of water there which, which we can utilise. So we're, we're rehabbing there as well. And um, on the, on the rich uh, flats there, we, we're developing those as well because I, I keep telling management we've got to make some money out of those rural assets. Does that answer your question? And, and on the question of stage three, yeah, we, we are... Well, uh, the land around Ipswich. Land around Ipswich, the old... Okay. Uh, the land around Ipswich. Um, Rosewood, we have some land there. We, uh, we had a mine called Oak Lee. Um, we've rehabbed that, but we obviously need that now to settle. Um, we're running a few cattle on that and we are selling some of that um, land at Rosewood um, and we also have some other areas in around uh, Mitswich which we're um, looking at to, to develop as well. And on, on your question around uh, Stage 3, we, we are continuing to progress that and, and turn soil. Um, we were um, really pleased with our ability you know, when we went out to uh, hire the new labour force, uh, so many of the the old um, employees reapplied for the job, so we've got, uh, we, you know, we've captured uh, that kind of culture that we had and, and, and knowledge, and um, uh, that's been really important. So hopefully we can continue to do that. You know, we, we obviously need to get that approval in, in place before we start um, 
you know, selling uh, coal. Uh, so we're hoping that that happens. And um, uh, but you know, right now we're we're, we're moving ahead. Just want to reiterate uh, the uh, the um, gratitude for holding the meeting here. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, so just wanted to ask about some less known investments: uh, the Malaysian healthcare business, and also the uh, the retirement living uh, business. Please. Mm -hmm. So Apex is uh, is listed in Malaysia. It's been in the portfolio for four decades. Uh, has a very interesting history. The father of the current um, ma management team uh, actually was a uh, an apprentice out uh, in in uh, in Sydney under Jim Milner, the previous uh, chairman, uh, and, uh, and and developed his skills as a as a pharmacist, and then went back to to Asia and and uh, and set up a business. And um, uh, so Solpat's invested in in that business, and it's been a great investment ever since. Uh, it's continuing to grow really really well. Uh, it's diversified into uh, you know a range of different healthcare products. Uh, and um, uh, between us and the, the founding family, I think we own you know, probably 50 or 60 percent of it. 70 percent. So it's not a, a huge free float, but um, uh, but it's a, a very good quality business. And and it's an interesting question because we've had a we've we've had some questions around what is our international exposure look like, uh, and we've thought about having a separate international part of our portfolio, but. We, we worked out that between two us and, and Apex, we already had international exposure in our strategic investments. Uh, in our private equity portfolio, you know, we, would, we would be mad to turn up in other countries and think that we can start uh, competing against uh, established private equity managers there. So we're going to start investing in other managers to get international exposure. In the, the listed portfolio, Brendan's done some analysis and f found out that in his large cap portfolio, uh, about 50% of revenues already come from, from uh, international sources. Uh, and then in the, uh, the structured uh, yield and, and credit space, again, we think this is such an interesting space that we, we're going to uh, invest in some offshore managers and we've deployed about $200 million, uh, or we've identified $200 million uh, to invest in uh, European and, and North American managers. So we, we are going to get an international flavour across our portfolio, but we're not you know, we're not uh, uh, silly enough to think that we can kind of uh, compete with people who are on the ground. Uh, we're going to partner with good people and, and, uh, and, and pay them to, to do what, what we uh, can't do from, from here. Uh, the other... Aged care. Aged care, yes. So uh, the, 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 uh, the picture that we had on the property portfolio was a building that's under um, construction at the moment in Cronulla in Sydney. Uh, it's... Um, it's a retirement village, so uh, you know a, a new style of retirement village, uh, high end, um, you know, high rise for people who, like minded, over 55s want um, uh, to downsize from their their family home and into something where they can be in a community, and and there's huge demand for it. We've actually struggled. We thought that we'd be able to get a portfolio of these. We've struggled to find the sites because we're competing with luxury uh, developers for residential products. So we haven't uh, been able to build nearly as many as, as we uh, would like, but maybe those conditions change. And we've certainly got the model working and, and, and the one that we've got under construction at the moment, uh, we think we'll do very well on. Uh, there's been huge demand for the product. Uh, there's a bit of a quirk in the way that you operate with retirement villages. You can't actually pre-sell them until they're complete. Um, so unlike residential uh, developments uh, that they all get pre-sold uh, with retirement, you're, you're on the hook until uh, uh, until it's all uh, complete. But we think that we'll complete that uh, by the end of this year, uh, and uh, and hopefully we can find many more of them. Um, I, sorry, I, I'd just like to thank you for coming to Brisbane. It's thank great you, to yeah, see you pleasure. guys here, and an excellent presentation. As a former Milton shareholder, it's very interesting to hear the strategic strategic difference between what you're doing and the way Milton operate, operated in the past. Um, I'm just wondering if the presentation today is going to be available on, on the website or elsewhere. Yeah, it was put onto the ASX platform uh, this morning, so you can, you can get it under our uh, uh, ASX ticker.
Thank you. Courtney, does there, over yes, there? I think we've only got time for one more question because there's a lot of food that <laughs> ready. Come and say that and the hot food. And we'll be around outside, so feel free to come up and ask uh, ask us anything you like. Thank you very much. Can you explain the rationale for maintaining the cross shareholding between Washington, uh, Seoul Paddington and Brickworks? Has that company ever considered a merger between the two companies? Yeah, there's no, um, there's no particular driver for maintaining the cross shareholding. I mean, it was something that was put in place in, in 1968, so it's just kind of a, a, a historical thing that, that continues to exist. Um, so we don't, we, yeah, we just treat Brickworks as an investment of ours and, and they treat uh, their investment in Souls just as an investment of, of theirs. So uh, the dynamic is no, not really different um, to the dynamic that we would have with any of our other investees. Um, and, uh, I mean, but I would say that you know, whilst it's, not, a, you know, it's not, in, not, not in our minds ab about the benefits of the cross shareholding because I, th I think it's just one of those things that had a time and a place uh, many years ago, but it has been very good for us in the sense that both companies have been able to entrench that long-term mindset around investing. Uh, because we've had the, the, the safety and security of having a major shareholder who, who had a, a similar uh, investment culture. And, um, and so, I mean, if you look at Brickworks, they, ha they have excess land that was previously uh, brick pits that any other uh, company probably would have sold off to a developer many, many years ago for, for low dollars. They held on to those investments, put them into a joint venture with Goodman, and, and that asset class has returned uh, in excess of 20% IRRs for 15 or 16 years for Brickworks. And, and, and it's that kind of long-term thinking that comes from the, the security of having us as a major shareholder. And vice versa, I mean, we've made lots of decisions that um, you know, we know, um, you know we, we have the, the support of our major shareholder and it's been very uh, helpful for us. But through the Milton merger, um, Brickworks was diluted as a shareholder in Souls from about 45% to about 26% today. So they're not the major shareholder they, they used to be. Uh, and when we think of our register today, we think of it, it is typically um, you know, mums and dads, 60,000 retail investors, and, and they're the people that, we, um, that we're here to serve. Thank you very much, everybody, and some great questions. And uh, as I said, we'll be outside, so I'd love to talk to you more. Thank you.